say a word or two to you. So it's really good to see you here this morning and on a beautiful day when we're about to get out of Congress for two weeks. <laughs> I'm impressed. <laughs> but you know, it's, it, the discussion today is really important because we're going to have a thoughtful educational discussion on ensuring that the Interior Department is working in coordination with the Western State neighbors to enhance and improve the habitat in the migration corridor for big game, such as the Rocky Mountain. Elk, mule deer, pronghorn, antelope, and others. The ones John used to love to shoot. Uh, I just I want to say how grateful we all are that you're here and that you're supporting the Sportsman's Caucus. I'm I can't believe I'm vice chair, but it's really important, and so I really want to thank you. We're shortly Congressman Fortin, Mary, and I are going to shortly be reintroducing and covering America's Wildlife Act. We're just going to dedicate funding to the wildlife conservation restoration program and we just need you so we gotta protect the outdoors we gotta protect our natural resources we gotta have good strong balanced discussions to make sure that people understand the importance of conservation and even though last week was an ugly week for me uh, we do have to protect people's ability to be in the outdoors the fishing the, I mean, the the sportsman's issues and get young people out there. So thanks for being here this morning. Thanks for participating in this discussion. It's people that are in this room that are going to protect our great outdoors. Thank you. Be careful not to oversell me. <laughs> <laughs> and I got to deliver. All right, thanks. Uh, the, the, the Mule Deer Working Group with the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies has been together for 20 years now. And the uh, fact sheets that you see here are, are just some of the products that we've produced on our website, MuleDeerWorkingGroup.com. And so we, we've been in this migration issue a little bit and been involved in, in, in how some of the stuff is unfolding. So this morning I wanted to just provide a, an overview of some of the migration science that's being assembled by scientists and, and biologists and how that information can be used for land management decisions and also how Western uh, wildlife agencies, state wildlife agencies are working together right now to identify these corridors and, and be able to use those in, in decision making uh, in the future and, and also how the state agencies are working with the federal agencies in, in the secretary order uh, rollout. So the, uh, the whole reason we're talking about migration corridors these days is because the radio collars with GPS units are, are becoming technologically better and better and cheaper and cheaper. It's allowed the researchers to hang a lot of these radio collars on a lot of different big game animals throughout the West and, and, and see how they use the habitat and see how they move across the landscape. And, and one thing we're learning uh, more about is areas where they're concentrating in winter on winter range and areas where they're concentrating on summer range and also how they get from one to the other. But one of the important things that's emerging from all this research is that line in between one and the other isn't just a conveyor belt that a deer decides it's going to go down the winter range down and jumps on the conveyor belt and zips down the winter range. But, but that line in between those seasonal habitats in itself is a really important habitat. And there's areas along there where they move quickly through that corridor and other areas where they, they, they linger um, for different reasons, usually probably replenish nutrients to continue their path along the way sometimes even having fawns in those stopover areas. So there's areas along that path that are more important than, than other areas. We call those stopover areas. And so we're starting to think not as these migration corridors are just lines in between two important habitats, but important <coughs> habitats themselves that, that we need to think about and, and preserve them in maybe some areas that are more important. Uh, one of the most famous long distance migration routes in, in, in the lower 48 is uh, the Red Desert to Hoback migration route. It's 150 miles that mule deer uh, travel one way, 150 miles back. And, and they'll spend four months in that population, they'll spend four months out of 12 in that migration corridor going one way or the other. So we're, we're starting to understand how important these corridors are. They're not just a, in a week, they go from one, one spot to the next, the next. And so here's an example of the, the kind of information that biologists and scientists right now are are assembling. In this example in, in northern New Mexico, there was an area where biologists knew that mule deer wintered in this winter range in, in northern New Mexico near the Colorado border. And they knew that at some point in the summertime, they just went up north and, and went farther up into the higher elevation habitat up into Colorado. But they didn't know where they went, they didn't know what passageways they used and how they got from one place to the next. So they went down into that winter range 
radio collar a bunch of mule deer when they're concentrated down a winter range, and then waited for things to warm up, waited for springtime, and those mule deer then went north, went up into the, the higher elevations in Colorado. And so we learn a lot from all of the GPS locations that are collected, in this case, every two to three hours uh, throughout the 24 hour period. So we learn how they get up there, we learn where they go in the summer, but, but those dots aren't even as important as, as when you connect all of those dots for an individual animal, you get lines in and you can see where each individual animal went. So then you start learning more about how they got there and their passageways. But as I said, these lines are more than just lines. So what we can do is called Brownian Bridge Movement Modeling. And, and, and it takes into account those points that are kind of clustered and those points where they, they linger along that pathway. And so we can, we can identify those stopover areas for each individual animal. And then we can also look at different animals and, and see where two different animals stayed at the same spot and lingered around the same area. So basically getting a second and a third opinion that that's, that's somehow important for some way. And so we can, we can start learning more and more about what parts of the landscape are more important than others. And we need that to make land use decisions and, and make sure that we're preserving these really critical, critical parts of the migration route. You can also pool all the animals in that population and, and do a Brownian bridge model and start to identify high, medium, and, and lower intensity use in that corridor, which tells us a lot more about which areas are really, really important for that population. And in some of these populations, if these migration corridors are severed, it can mean a 50% loss in, in the mule deer in, in that population. And so these things are extremely important because they wouldn't make these long distance dangerous movements if it wasn't really important for their, for their the health of that population. So this is kind of information that um, agencies are starting to gather. Wyoming is way out ahead of, of other agencies that have been working on this a long time, and because they have some of the longest uh, migration routes of a, a lot of species in, in that state. And so the Wyoming Migration Initiative, along with Wyoming Game and Fish, have uh, been working together for a long time to identify uh, these corridors in a lot of different species. So all these colors up here are different species. They're, they're uh, bighorn sheep, pronghorn, elk, mule deer. And as you sit back and you start finding out where these are, then we can start making land use decisions um, when it comes to other important things that are important to us, like energy development. And if we know where these important corridors are, then we at least have a chance to make some informed decisions rather than, uh, rather than uninformed decisions. And it's not just uh, energy development, but even our communities throughout the West. If, if uh, Pinedale had known in the 1950s that there was a choke point uh, of funneling of pronghorn just west of town there, they, they would at least have a chance to, to make some intelligent decisions on how they build out and, and preserving some permeability and letting animals move through that landscape. So this baseline information is really important. You may hear about oil and gas and, and migration corridors a lot in the news, but the fact is there's only a couple of states that are dealing with energy development and migration corridors, but every state is dealing with transportation infrastructure and how that can, can impact migration corridors. When you start putting these uh, GPS collars on these animals and, and, and finding out where they go and, and hang out for the whole entire year, you see some obvious evidence of, of those transportation infrastructure stopping from long distance historical corridors. And the good news is for, in, in that case, when it's transportation corridors, is that there's, uh, there's actually things we can do to, uh, to, to help that out, to improve the, the permeability through the landscape. So one example is, uh, and there's examples throughout the state, but one example is the Highway 9 in, in Colorado, where they had a 10 and a half mile stretch of highway, had a lot of mortalities, a lot of vehicle collisions. Just in that 10 and a half mile stretch, they went in and they put uh, two overpasses and 500 passes and a couple of culverts in, in redoing the highway there. In the first three years, they've had over 45,000 mule deer that they've documented using some of those crossings. So, so that's 45,000 mule deer that didn't come across the road in front of drivers dodging in between cars. People see them through their windshield or people see them through their windshield. And so making highways safer is a byproduct of, we're talking about getting these animals safely across the road, but there's a human element that is, is much more important and, and they come hand in hand. When we got wildlife get across the road safely, we also make the, those highways a lot safer for, for people that have that commute. Um, and, and wildlife vehicle collisions uh, reduce 89%. So they had on the average 56 mule deer get on the road there uh, every year in that 10 mile stretch and now it's down.
down to uh, six per year. So that's just an example. There's another one in, in Arizona where we had a new road that came through really good desert bighorn sheep habitat. And so Arizona Game and Fish worked with Arizona Department of Transportation way ahead of time and built designed into that, that new highway an overpass. And, and we know how to build these overpasses. There's been enough research in the last uh, 10 to 15 years where we, we know now what works to move animals across or <coughs> over on their highways. And so we can work if, if we're out ahead of time and, and we're, we're years out working with transportation, we can build these in here that are very effective and, and move animals and, and resolve some of those problems. Uh, it all costs money, these things aren't cheap. So this new one, uh, over 6,000 bighorn sheep have been documented to use that and zero collision since that went in. So there's examples, there's, there's examples of elk in uh, Arizona where we didn't even build any new structures we had some, some bridges that spanned over the, over the uh, canyons, and elk could go on there and, and avoid having to go over the highway, but elk go wherever they want, so they just cross the road wherever they wanted to, and we had a lot of problems there with elk getting to get on the road. All we did was retrofit some fencing to funnel the elk to force them to use those expansion bridges and go under those areas, and, and you can see the dramatic result, 97% reduction in, in, uh, in collisions on the, the road. So there's these examples out there uh, this stuff that, that uh, is very effective in, in moving animals across the road and making things safer. Now I want to talk about how agencies are working together to, to kind of pull all this information and work in a coordinated way to, uh, to uh, first of all, identify the corridors and then to, uh, uh, and then to, do, to work towards actually making landscape decisions to improve this landscape permeability. So about two and a half years ago, um, Pew Charitable Trust, the Mueller Working Group that I chair, and Wyoming Migration Initiative all came together and started working together on, on how could we take the information that they're learning in Wyoming, because they're out ahead of everybody in, in this case, and, and take that, outsource that in a series of workshops throughout the West to teach other biologists how to, how to collect data that's useful, how to analyze the data, how to visualize the data so it's useful for policymakers and, and land use decisions. And so, we started with the first workshop in Oregon in October of 2017, and we got biologists together from, from four states, and, and we talked about migration corridors. We spent the morning talking about the status of migration science, what people are finding, specifically a lot of input, mostly from Wyoming Game and Fish and Wyoming Migration Initiative, what kind of science is out there, what kind of tools people are using to identify these corridors and to use those. And we talked about what federal policy there was that was related to um, these corridors and conserving these corridors. And we had Wyoming Game and Fish people who have, have taken some of this information and, and made state policy. And, and some of their um, and some of their trials and tribulations and, and um, some of their advice for states kind of turning this information into something useful in policy. And then the afternoon, all the biologists, they brought their own laptops, they brought their own data sets, and they sat down in the afternoon and all the biologists went through a, a piece of software that Wyoming Migration Initiative designed and it, it allows biologists to take just dots in a spreadsheet, just coordinates in a spreadsheet, and run it through this really easy to use free software on the internet and turn those dots into these corridors like I've, like I've showed up here. And so we had all the biologists that had, didn't have any experience in doing any of this left after that afternoon with being able to take a spreadsheet of coordinates and produce these maps and actually see where these corridors are. And so that first, first uh, workshop was a big success. But it was after that that, that, that then Secretary Zinke signed the Secretary of Order 3362 that, uh, <coughs> to tell the bureaus and the Department of the Interior to identify these corridors and, and work to conserve them. And so these workshops that we began were actually the perfect infrastructure, the perfect vehicle for actually getting states together and identifying those and, and implementing those. And so our second workshop that we had in Mystique, Casey Stemler, who we'll talk uh, next, was on board and he came to all of the other workshops and, and that provided him a way to directly interface with the states in a federal state coordination in the, for the rest of the, the workshops. And in the end, in the course of, uh, course of uh, about a year, we held four workshops throughout the West. We had 282 attendees. Like I said, we could have had a lot more. Um, 13 states were, were attended those workshops, including all 11 that are specifically mentioned in the secretarial order. Um, mostly state agencies, that was the intent. Um, we had some federal partners that were there. We had uh, a few tribal, we had some department transportation, and, um, and, and of course, uh, uh, and the federal, our federal partners. And in that, we had 110 agency biologists that were trained in using the migration mapper software. So think about how powerful that is to have 13 states in the West 
using this really easy to use software and having all the biologists taking their docs in spreadsheets and converting that into useful corridors that can be, can, they can go across state boundaries when we have interstate migration, because everybody's using the same software and everybody's analyzing the same way. There's a few states that aren't using that software, but it doesn't matter. Once they create corridors and we have a polygon for that corridor, um, that corridor can be added to corridors that are, that are devised uh, any other way. And so we, we've got this state and federal um, collaboration to pull together migration research in, in a pretty easy uh, way, a pretty easy analytical way with that software. Uh, there was so much interest afterwards that there was a Wyoming Migration Initiative did a, a follow-up webinar and um, 150 people attended that. And that was mostly that first morning of, of the status of migration research. But the, the nice thing about this uh, the software that people are using to analyze those dots is that it's free on the internet. They can download it and it's built to be very, very simple to use. Uh, and, and so it's not just those people that were there that were trained. They come back, and, and I've had people in our agency just download it, play around with it, and, and find out how to use it uh, pretty easily. And so this is a great example of, of not only collaboration just among the state agencies to kind of do things together in a coordinated way, but, but also collaboration of state agencies working pretty seamlessly with the uh, federal agencies and the land management agencies to, to identify uh, these corridors. I think we're, we're well on the we, we, we've got some data. Um, Wyoming is, is, as I said, way out ahead of other people in, in identifying these corridors. And, and now the other states have the knowledge. We've got some solutions when it comes to transportation, uh, corridors, and, and fixing migration, uh, which is there. And, and so we're, we're, we're well positioned to, um, to preserve and, and preserve these uh, corridors. Down here. Those the mouse. Click it. Yep. In the, in the I'm a little, uh, he's always my help. <laughs> <laughs> We've done a lot of these together. Yeah. Literally everyone, Jim goes first, I go second, and I have to ask Jim how to run everything. So yeah. thanks for having me here, and I really appreciate everyone attending. Obviously, this is a topic that is, is of interest to a lot of people across the United States. Obviously, we're focused on the West, but hopefully some of the things I talked about today will resonate. One of my overarching objectives with the implementation of this order is to try to do it in such a manner that it creates durability. I've, I've been in government for 27 years, and I've seen issues like this, initiatives, whatever you want to call them, come and go. And I've watched what it takes to do them right, and I've watched what it takes to kill them really quickly. So my, my attempt and my effort is to really handle this in a manner that we can have it around for many, many years to come. So the last 12 years, I served as a very popular joint measure I don't know how many of you are familiar with joint ventures, but they are a voluntary, non-regulatory partnership. And they work in very specific areas across the country. And they use science to help guide them and focus their habitat conservation. Over those 12 years, I've picked up a number of lessons, but there's a couple lessons I'd like to share with you that I think will provide context for how I'm looking forward to the implementation of this order. It's really important and it really pays well long term to invest in science. We we'll use that science to develop an implementation plan, and that plan helps guide where you focus your conservation. I think we have to always remember it's very important to bring to the table and to work well with a very broad range of partners. I also think it's important to remember that we must be flexible if we hope to be successful. Probably the most important lesson to learn is not to let the perfect be the enemy of the good. When you're dealing across 11 states, when you're dealing with this many partners, uh, a lot of things are going to happen. A lot of things are going to happen probably not the way that you thought they were going to happen. So you just have to be mindful of that. Okay, click it. Yeah, click you need what? To click the big, the big slide on the left. The slide that's up on the screen, you need to actually click in that. <laughs> on that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> So the order was signed in February 2018. I was asked to come on as a coordinator in May uh, of 2018. And since that time, um, really, well, when I started, I should say, really worked hard on trying to, to determine how I was going to implement this. I fell back on my days with the joint venture. That's why I think it's important to explain some of the lessons I learned there. The species of focus in this joint venture are under the management authority of the state wildlife agency. So throughout the order, it speaks about the department working very closely with the state agencies. 
You've heard from Jim's presentation, and I think most of you know, there's three species of focus, mule deer, elk, pronghorn, and it's across 11 western states. Language throughout the order speaks to conserving, restoring, enhancing, and improving the condition of priority, big game, <coughs> habitats. I've heard this on a number of presentations and questions that have come forward about why are we just focused on three species, and I'll get into that a little bit later, but I would submit, having done habitat conservation for many years, what we're doing for these three species benefit a heck of a lot more than these three species. We do habitat conservation work that benefits a lot of species. One of the first things I did out of the gate was develop these seven principles and objectives. I thought it was important to have some touchstones that I could always, and the people that are helping implement this, always look back to to remind us how we're implementing this. The first one is respect the state authority to manage big game, big game wildlife. Very important to remember, particularly working in the West, I would say in anywhere, we have to respect private property rights. We have to recognize this order can't be everything to everyone. Our folks, as soon as the order was signed, I got phone calls about salmon, grizzly bears, bison, and, and that's exactly what happens when things like this come forward. I get it, everybody wants to see their self in it, specifically, but as soon as you start adding those types of things, you really do it together. You have to remain focused on the state defined priority, <coughs> migration corridor, and the range areas. I mentioned it earlier, I think without an implementation plan or an action focus plan, what happens is traditionally, People will go out across the landscape, they'll do lots of little projects that feel good, but when you tally those up in a cumulative fashion, you find out that little conservation has actually been accomplished. You have to recognize that the BLM lands and Forest Service lands are multiple use lands. That's the law. And then I mentioned at the beginning, we're trying to do this so it creates durability. And based on the experience I've had in the joint venture world, <coughs> one way to do this is to work in collaboration. We always must remember that we don't do this alone, we have to work with others. Jim mentioned a couple times, uh, and you can see it at the bottom of the slide, it said Hall Sawyer. This is another Hall Sawyer slide. He is a researcher out of Wyoming, who is well known in the big game migration corridor arena. And what you see here, again, Jim mentioned the Red Desert Herbat Migration Corridor in western Wyoming. You can visualize this, which what Paul did is essentially took a knife and cut down the length of this corridor. And what you see here is a side view of the entire length of that corridor. What's important is the ribbon across the bottom. Really nothing else at this point. On the left hand side is the winter range. Okay? That's down here. On the right hand side is the summer range, which is up on the top. What this ribbon shows is land ownership. <coughs> What I'm trying to show here, or what is fact, is the white is private land, the yellowish is BLM land, I guess the purplish color, lavender blue, is school trust land, and then the orange is Wyoming Game and Fish land, and the green is Forest Service land. The important point here, this is not unlike many areas across the West, the land ownership pattern. If we don't do this right, if we don't work in cooperation with people, if we don't follow those principles that I mentioned earlier, imagine if one of the agencies decide they don't want to cooperate and play along. Well, imagine if a group of those landowners don't want to cooperate and play along. Their conservation effort that you're trying to do is really, really, really difficult. I want to move into a couple of the uh, actual steps of the implementation process. The order calls for identifying five liaisons. Those folks are working on collateral detail uh, duty to help me implement this plan. When I was brought forward from the Bureau's various names of these individuals, I really wanted to have a diversity of, of folks. And what I mean by that is I wanted to have someone, one at least, from the Fish and Wildlife Service, from the BLM, from the Park Service. I thought it was really important to have that different perspective around the table, but I also thought it was important to get the buy-in from the individual bureaus. So these individuals, the state on the left are the states that they are uh, responsible for, 
and on the right is their, is their bureau and actually where they physically sit. So these folks are out on the ground and they work with the state wildlife agencies and others and partners uh, on a daily basis. Once I charted the path uh, for moving forward, I drafted a letter to all 11 state fish and wildlife agency directors. I asked them to tell us what are your top three, three to five priority migration corridor, stopover, or winter range areas. I also suspected that probably they wouldn't have all that information, so I asked them to provide us with their top research priority to help fill some of those data gaps. And this may not seem like a big deal, um, but it is. We actually got responses back from all 11 states, uh, and that was that was really told me that this is a real issue for the states. They're very interested in this, so that built a lot of trust. I felt that we're going to make something happen. We took that information that the states provided, and we combined it with USDA information, any relevant DOI information, and we developed what we call the state action plans. And we provided a template, if you will, so we want to try to consistency across the state. So we took the data or the information that was supplied, we put it in these state action plans. The, the original idea behind these plans was, was really create a, create a document to allow us to, to focus, to develop partnerships, and ultimately be used as a tool to get habitat conservation done. I think it's important to note that if one were to look at the plans and see a variety of submissions, the fact of the matter is most states do not know or they do not have a map their big game migration corridors. And I could even say that in some instances for the uh, winter range areas. But you know, that should be expected. Jim talked about it. Some of this technology is very new. And so the states are just trying to get caught up with some of this new technology deployed in their state and be able to develop things. So I think just important to keep in the back of your mind. Along those lines, I mentioned in the letter that we uh, asked the states to provide their number one research priority. And all states did that. And some states we had to kick back and work back and forth with them until we felt comfortable providing funding for their research project. But every state, all 11 states, got their number one research uh, proposal funded up to a cap that we had to provide. You can see the species of focus led by mule deer, followed by pronghorn, and then elk. Just a quick example of, of some of those research projects. In Utah, they had uh, three herds that they were very interested in. They didn't know much about these herds, so they went out and captured mule deer in three different areas for a total of 180 mule deer. And, and the reason they were interested in these, I didn't realize that Utah is one of the fastest growing states in the nation. So you have this fast population growth, along with the increased housing development, and also the increase in vehicle traffic really is causing a concern for them. So our support of this project has allowed them to put transmitters out there. We've already seen some of the data from this, and these mule deer are moving much further than they ever anticipated. Another project example is out of Nevada. They submitted one proposal, which was 60 pronghorn, very important populations for them. And their objective was to simply find out where these animals go. When they go to their winter range, how long do they spend uh, their time on the winter range? So once they know that, they're going to take this information, they're going to define those corridors, and then develop habitat, uh, habitat projects to improve the habitat in those areas. USGS, their response to the order was to look at their strengths, as they should, and they looked at MAP. And so Matt Kaufman from the USGS Wyoming Cooperative Research Unit set up a corridor mapping team. And the idea behind this team was to bring together federal researchers, state researchers, and RP was strong. There were 20 proposals seeking $6.6 million. As with most grant processes that people have been through, not all those projects are worthy of funding, but there were a fair number that were worthy of funding, but they would not fit fund because they didn't have the money or they didn't have the right color of money to fund those projects. Additionally, the Fish and Wildlife Service Partners Fish and, Partners Fish and Wildlife Program set aside $1.5 million annually, and they conducted an internal process working with the state agencies to develop uh, proposals. They had 44 proposals. 22 of those were, were funded across eight western states. <clears throat> and then lastly, I've been approached by um, 
several foundations to give presentations. One was the biodiversity, I see Christy, because she was sitting right next to me on the panel. The Biodiversity Funders Group is actually a, a event here in Washington, D.C. To date, even though, despite following up, I have not been contacted by any of those groups to contribute money uh, in support of this, even though they told me it's a priority. What, what I'm starting to learn is maybe they're not so interested in the habitat conservation of the science, but more in the advocacy. But I'm hoping to find a foundation or two that would be willing to work with NIFWF or whoever and support some of these uh, great projects that they're trying to do. Some of the examples of the habitat projects quickly with the NIFWF. Uh, some conservation easements were funded, one in Nevada, one in Wyoming, for example. Those were funded through the Conifer Phillips Fund, because that'll, you know, those funds allowed us to do that. Habitat restoration in Nevada, they have a lot of fires out there, it's burned up a lot of very important habitat, so they did some habitat restoration, and then also some habitat management activities. With the Department of Fish and Wildlife uh, funding, most of those projects that were funded had to do with fencing, either removing interior fencing, replacement with wildlife friendly fencing, or very innovative project in Montana where they're testing out virtual fences. So there is no, they have collars on the cow, kind of like your dog in the yard kind of thing. So I'm anxious to see how that works out. Other projects that were funded on private land include weed management, and some peanut juniper removal, and sagebrush habitat. When I sent the letter out to all the, the states, there was a series of questions I asked that they respond to. One of those questions I asked was, could you please tell us what the risks and threats are within your priority corridors or winter range areas. The only issue that was mentioned by every single state, all 11 states, was highways. Clearly this is a significant issue for the western states, and so I, I got these data, I saw the data, it kind of caught my attention, maybe I should have noticed it, but I didn't until I tallied everything up. So I approached the Secretary of Interior and the Deputy Secretary, and I said, hey, look, look at what's going on here. Would you guys be willing to go over to your counterparts in the Department of Transportation and have a conversation? And they said absolutely. So they initiated those conversations. <coughs> On the state level, there's been various wildlife uh, transportation workshops. Most recently, one was held in Montana, but they've had them in Colorado, and they've had them also in Wyoming. But my point is, is that communication on this transportation issue is occurring at the highest federal levels and at various state levels. And then in January 2019, Really, in response to the outcomes from the, the Secretary of Order, there was an Unlit and Transportation Workshop held in Salt Lake City. And Ed Arnett from TRCT, he'll be following me as soon as I'm done here, providing some details on that workshop. Now that you know, I arrived near the end of my presentation, there's, there's three points that I kind of want to drive home. Because these keep popping up, and I, I hear about them, and I read about them, and I want to just make sure that we're all on the same page. So, this, the implementation of this effort really demonstrates a true federal, state, cooperative, collaborative process. The states identify the research priorities. The states identify the areas where we are going to do habitat conservation because they are the authority responsible for the management of big game species. In turn, the federal government, we're trying to marshal the resources. We're sharing our technical expertise. <coughs> We're taking management actions on federal lands, and we're trying to bring attention to this issue. This is a voluntary process. We've never told any landowner they have to do anything. We feel the only way that this can be successful and have longevity is if it's a voluntary process. And we do not, I'm talking about the federal government, I'm talking about this secretary of order, we do not designate corridors. The only state, as I mentioned in my first bullet, states identify those priority areas. The only state that has a formal process for identifying quarters is Wyoming. Now, some other states, I know New Mexico is kicking around some state legislation about potentially doing this. Um, and maybe some other states will follow. But I also believe there are probably some states that will never see their quarters. They'll never provide those publicly. For a various you know, a number of reasons that are there at the state level, but it's, it's not our business. And then finally, I'll talk about the next steps. Uh, what we'll be doing next, by the end of this month, I'll send a letter back out to the State Fish and Wildlife Agency directors. 
asking them to provide updated information on their three to five corridors. I do know there are a couple states who have analyzed data, who have developed the maps. So we'll see Utah being one of them to my mind. We'll see uh, corridors in a number of states from which we haven't seen them before. We've been able to provide science support in the way of funding research, data analysis, and mapping, and I really hope uh, we have the ability to continue to do that. You know, on the hot habitat side, I've been doing habitat, like I said, for a long time. There's never enough money to do all the habitat conservation we want to, and this is the case here, but we are going to continue to work as hard as we can to get good habitat work done. And then finally, uh, as mentioned by Jim, we've had several meetings with USDA uh, seeking their involvement. The, those conversations will continue. I think there's a lot of opportunities, particularly the Forest Service, but also NRCS, for their, their increased involvement. And then the Department of Interior, uh, excuse me, Department of Transportation, I know for certain, despite the changes that are going on in the Department of Interior, those conversations between DOI and DOT will continue. Thank you. Up with the transportation theme. There it is. Um, so Jim and Casey mentioned uh, both uh, transportation issues. I'm going to give you a little bit of a highlight of our workshop and talk a little bit about transportation buildings. I'm going to introduce you to a new word, perhaps, to some of you on Gillets. We, uh, but we're focusing on big game, and I thought, well, that encompasses bears and everything else. This workshop was focused like a laser on the species that were uh, uh, falling under the auspices of 3362 that Casey mentioned. So we called it ungulates, which comes from the Latin word ungulate, and the means uh, eater toad, the mammals. Um, so it's pretty obvious that animals cross the road. It's pretty obvious that they can get into trouble when they cross the road. And this impacts both the animals themselves as well as people um, and property damage and, and life, loss of life and, and the whole works. But these are very pervasive features in the landscape as well. Um, you have basically a linear feature that, that may uh, cause habitat, does cause habitat fragmentation, uh, can have behavioral impacts and avoidance. Jim showed a great slide of Interstate 80. Um, and that is depicted here in some, some information from uh, uh, Arizona showing that basically migration stops at these highways. So obviously there's a behavioral relationship. The animals are reacting uh, to these features as well. Uh, and this could be, um, in this particular example, it may not be necessarily, in the Interstate 80 example, it may not necessarily be a safety issue the animals just aren't using the the crossings in some situations, or uh, going across the road in some situations, but it's separate migration, so you have an ecological impact. We can also have uh, impacts on outdoor recreation, population, uh, sustainability, all those kinds of things. But the good news is there are solutions, and Jim shared some examples with you, um, and we'll talk a little bit about what we learned at this workshop. Why this workshop? Casey just mentioned some of the states have been having their own um, sessions, getting together with their departments of transportation and wildlife agencies. Wyoming led the way on that particular endeavor, followed by Colorado and then Montana had their workshop. And, and of course, Casey mentioned that all had Jim as well. All 11 states identified transportation. We got together and said we need to bring people together collectively to learn from each other and move forward. And that's exactly what we did. We pulled together this workshop. Um, the amazing thing about this picture is 98% of the participants are looking forward and smiling. That's, that's an accomplishment in itself, uh, with their eyes open. Uh, this workshop was sponsored by the groups here. You can see Wild Sheep Foundation, National Wildlife Federation, Federal Premium Ammunition, um, uh, National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, RMBF, uh, Archery Trade Association, and Mule Deer Foundation. So we appreciate those sponsors greatly for helping to put this together. We had 80 participants representing uh, 12 state DOTs, uh, 11 wildlife agencies, uh, Federal Highway Administration is there, DOI, NRCS, the Highway Lost Data Institute, which to my knowledge was the first time we were able to get those folks in the room to share information uh, from that insurance industry perspective and their, their independent perspectives, NGOs and foundations. And our goal was to bring people together, diverse agencies and actors with stake in the game on wildlife and highways. And I, I just will remind folks, as Casey said, or somebody said earlier, whatever Casey, this issue transcends multiple species of wildlife. It's not just 
ungulates and big game animals. It, it transcends all wildlife that need to get across the road. Um, so we brought those folks together to learn from one another, share information, catalyze that learning, and the connections across these states within and among the agencies and across stakeholders, identify best practices and points of leverage for action, and advance that planning and, and action of the states uh, that, that Casey mentioned earlier to under the uh, Secretarial Order 3362. We wanted leadership in the room, and actually had it not been for the federal shutdown, we would have had Acting Secretary David Bernhardt at the meeting, as well as the Federal Highways Administrator, Randy Hendrickson. That caused some conflicts with those folks, but they were committed to coming and demonstrating how important this issue was to them. In the state of Utah, where this was held, this is Lieutenant Governor uh, Spencer Cox, who showed up and made some remarks, as well as the directors of the Wildlife Agency, Mike Fouts, and uh, Carlos Braceres of the Department of Transportation, both giving very, very good com conversation and discussion about their commitments to this issue in that state. So I want to give you a very high level of our discussions and highlights. Uh, we had a blend of, of uh, presentations on various topics, as well as breakout sessions to really roll up our sleeves and understand what information we had and what we needed and how we were going to try to operationalize that. Um, and we, what emerged from our workshop were four major themes, and it was all centered around uh, data monitoring, evaluation, and research. That was kind of one obvious category. People were bringing information to the table, but also talking about what information we needed. Coordinating plans, processes, and procedures. Policy and sources of funding. And then, of course, building and sustaining partnerships. So just a quick highlight on each of those. Jim has already given you some solid examples with a little more information than I will, but clearly these things work. Up to 97% fewer collisions uh, for elk in, in that particular example, but they definitely work. When you look through the literature, it's replete with examples of how these structures actually work. And it centers on three things, and this, this slide actually comes from some work and coalescence of information of one of Jim's colleagues, Jeff Gagnon. The three keys to success for this are placement, design, and fencing. The fencing is absolutely critical to funnel the animals into the structure. The structure has to be designed, not only with engineering considerations, but also things that the animals are thinking about too, line of sight and a variety of other things to make it look as natural as possible. And then placement is obviously critical. You, you have to put it more in the animals normally would want to go or where migration occurs and such. So a little bit more detail on some data. This is a very interesting uh, presentation by the Highway Loss Data Institute. Now, I want to highlight this for a couple of reasons, but interestingly enough, the, uh, if you look at this, this is multiple states across the West, and I don't expect you to see it, but you see peaks and valleys, and those peaks are really, really consistent in November, and the troughs are very consistent in August. Deer contribute the highest percentage, about 77%, nearly 80% of the uh, collision strikes. And those animal strikes account for 10% of the comprehensive claims and 25% of the money that's doled out on comprehensive claims at an average cost of about $3,000 per claim. The Fast Act program and MAP 21 are programs that provide the current funding that we see for wildlife crossings and connectivity. That's embedded in these various programs, the uh, Federal Highway Safety Improvement Program, Service Transportation Block Grants, and others through the Federal uh, Lands and Tribal Transportation Programs. You can see these three. The interesting thing is there's currently language that allows for the use of those funds for fish and wildlife mitigation projects, but no, no, not necessarily any guarantees. It's still subject to the state prioritization. And funding limitations uh, like um, the, the the FLTP program has a $10 million cap on what can be used for wildlife. So these are areas that we saw as an opportunity. And there's currently no carve-out program uh, specifically dedicated for fish and wildlife. And there's obviously some resistance to that, to establishing dedicated programs for wildlife mitigation. But I ask a pretty simple question. I'm, I'm an outcome-based person. I'm not necessarily concerned about how we get there, but we have to get there in terms of prioritizing wildlife and and fish and connectivity. So uh, just so we have the assurances that they will in fact be a priority in these areas where we're having high human incidents of very good uh, impact as well as uh, impacts on wildlife and continued movements and, and such. 
So uh, we have a transportation bill forthcoming and now under consideration. Uh, we recently, and I mean recently, just a couple of days ago, sent a letter uh, that was passed through our TRCP Policy Council as well as the American Wildlife Conservation Partners. It was sent to Senate EPW um, and the Transportation and Infrastructure Subcommittee. It was signed by 44 groups, a wide range of groups uh, signed this in the conservation and sporting community. And our basic recommendations were to develop a new innovation grant for fish and wildlife connectivity uh, with at least $50 million annually. I believe that's the number we had, had put in there uh, as a starting point. Uh, to start moving this issue forward, remove that $10 million cap. Uh, we'd like to see an increase in forest road funding to bring it up to par maybe more with uh, National Park Service uh, funding budgets for roads as well, and continue the investment in these access programs uh, through through the transportation bill as well. So that was a very quick high-level summary of some of the things that we found and where we see this moving. Um, and I'll leave this up because I wouldn't expect to be able to write that down very quickly, but we can get that to the members uh, and send out this link. But all of our presentations from this workshop, the synthesis of the uh, findings, uh, both an executive summary as well as about a 30-page summary of the conversations are embedded in this, as well as a variety of additional information and resources from our, from our workshop. And that's what I've had, Andy. Thanks very much.